So, moving on to our first wine. Uh, the one I've got in front of me is the Avery's Carver. So other alternatives to this could be another traditional method, sparkling wine, so other carvers. Cremont made in the various regions of France. You've also got Champagne and English sparkling wine, which is really, really great to try if you haven't tried already. Um, so sparkling wine is often seen as a wine that you have before a meal. Um, and it's often one that people forget about when you're thinking about food and wine pairing. So it's not just to go with starters, but for main courses as well. And the bubbles bring a bit of texture to the wine, uh, which makes it a really good match for creamy food. So think creamy cheese and things like that. Traditional method sparkling wines also have a high level of acidity. Um, and when you have a wine with good acidity, it can go with food that's got a good bit of acidity in it as well. Um, if you have a food that's high in acidity, so think uh, lemony seafood, um, and you have a wine that's low in acidity, like a Viognier, the wine is what we use a term for, it becomes flabby. So it tends to fall flat and it's quite a good descriptor because you lose the qualities of the wine um, and it's not enhancing the wine and food pairing at all. So avoid low acidity wines. You want to have um, a, a wine with at least as much acidity as the food. Um, and acidity also cuts through oiliness in food. So there's a few things you can do to test this at home. Um, you can just get a piece of lemon. So uh, have a sip of a wine, preferably high acidity. So we could have other alternatives here that aren't just sparkling. Um, we could look at uh, Picpoul uh, in the south of France. We could look at the Loire Valley. We've got Sauvignon Blanc. And we could again go to Galicia. So those coastal regions, what grows together goes together is often a good place to start, as I've mentioned. Um, take a sip of the wine, have a little bit of lemon and have another sip of the wine. If you were to do this with Viognier, you would find it just really just disappears um, and you lose all those qualities of ripe stone fruits and what you're left with is just something that's quite light and the body's been removed. So a piece of lemon is a good thing to try it with. Also, tins of sardines, so that oiliness I was talking about. Oily food really gets cut through the greasiness, it kind of refreshes your palate and it gets that sensation going where you have a piece of food, you want a little sip more wine, you want another bite of food and that's what we really want to get going here is that kind of knock-on effect of one is really enhancing the other as you continue along your meal. The next wine I have for you um, is actually a rosé. So again a wine that's often forgotten about when they are thinking of food and wine pairings. Um, rosé such as the Bastide which is from the Rhone so a high percentage of Grenache which gives it lots of body nice and fruity a little bit of syrup in there as well um, alternatives to this could be you've got Provence rosés you've also got rosés from Spain so tend to be slightly deeper coloured but you can actually get them that are bone dry don't always be put off by the colour um, it's good to get to know different producers and then you know they're going to make the same style year to year so if you want to avoid those sweeter ones it's worth doing a bit of research first um, but the bold flavours of a rosé the really kind of uh, vibrant fruit flavours are what we want to play around with here so intensity of fruit in the wine matches with uh, more intense flavours in a food um, so think about um, those umami flavours that we mentioned at the start um, and how they can strip away the fruitiness in a wine. If you start with something that's quite fruity then you're going to end up with something that's still very um, agreeable with the food that you're having. So also very good with um, rosés tend to have uh, of different styles, particularly Provence, they also have that acidity in there. So good with slightly richer seafood. So think of something um, like aromatic Thai prawns, or even one of my favorite matches is a nice Provence rosé with Marie Rose prawn sauce, which you can make quite easily at home. And um, you get the creaminess, the boldness of that paprika, um, the tomato flavors sometimes coming through, as well as the intensity of the fruit in the rosé, which means uh, they're both enhancing each other and it tends to make the, the food taste a little bit creamier. Um, if you're feeling extravagant, then vintage champagne, uh, rosé vintage champagne is a great way to go. Uh, another really good option with um, savoury foods, um, but also good with acidity, like I mentioned. So if you want to try this at home, test it with a, a cherry tomato, something like that. And you want those fresh tomato flavours um, that aren't dampened by any oak ageing, um, they're really preserved by the freshness in the wine, so you're not losing anything by putting those two together. 
Up next, we have a Pinot Gris from Alsace. So Pinot Gris, um, amongst other great varieties in Alsace, including Gewürz, Traminer and Riesling, can come in a variety of styles, um, but they are known for being very aromatic, nice, ripe, uh, intense stone fruit flavours, and also um, have that little bit of residual sugar, so sugar that's left behind once the, uh, left in the wine, sorry, once the fermentation is finished, which add to the body and the texture of a wine, but also mean that they're a great match when you're pairing with spicy food. Um, so we're looking at savory dishes with a sweet wine here. Um, and we've already noted that um, spiciness is intensified by the alcohol in a wine. So normally these residual sugar wines are a good way to look out for ones that are gonna have that sweetness level, is to look at the alcohol content. So um, wines uh, around nine, 10% alcohol are gonna have more of that sugar when they're made um, in the Alsace style. So Riesling, Gewürztraminer, Pinot Gris. And you can find wines like this around the world. Um, some wines like Viognier um, do have that uh, residual sugar content as well, as well as the full flavour. And this is important because spiciness can uh, take away the, the fruitiness of a wine. So you want to start with something that's quite fruity to start off with so that it can stand up against the intense spiciness of your food. Um, if you like your food to really kind of set you on fire and you're a lover of heat, then by all means go for something that's got high alcohol content, 14%. You'll really notice the difference. Um, and something to test this at home with, I mean, there's a variety of different uh, ways you can go. Um, if you look at Thai food and curry and things like that, you could always look at what you accompany them with. So get a slightly spicy mango chutney, see how that works for you. Um, in every crisp, crisp cupboard, uh, we have something like Thai sweet chilli crisps. And if you're feeling quite brave, then a couple of drops of Tabasco on a teaspoon. That'll emulate those flavours of um, Asian spices, Indian food, Friday night curry takeaway. Uh, just something to play around with um, if you have a few spare moments when you're at home, which I'm sure we all do at the moment. Okay, as I've already mentioned, um, food and wine combinations are a great way to explore new wine styles or different grapes or regions that you might not be familiar with. Um, so this particular wine that I've chosen uh, it comes from Austria, as you'll note by the lid, um, and it is a grape called Zweigelt. So Zweigelt, um, uh, taste tested as well, um, is a grape variety that gives incredible freshness um, and it is more light to medium bodied. And alternatives to this could include anything from young Sangiovese to Pinot Noir to a, a Beaujolais Village, something like that. Uh, and what you get from those wines is a lovely freshness, often no oak aging, um, and really uh, uh, the younger wine, the no oak, the fresher fruit means that they go with foods that you want to preserve the freshness in as well. Also means they tend to have a good level of acidity. Um, and another example of this would be Valpolicella in Italy. Um, you've got a really fresh, zippy, acidic wine and they often go, as we've already mentioned, grows together, goes together. Um, Tomato-based dishes are really popular in Italy. And um, that's no exception when it comes to trying these wines together. So you could go back into the store cupboard or the fridge and find something like sun-dried tomatoes. Or if you've managed to get some cured meats and things like that, these kind of wines often benefit from being put in the fridge for half an hour because they're lighter in body. Put them in the fridge for half an hour before you're drinking them. Take them out, that slight coolness, uh, makes them a really perfect match for sunshine wine drinking. So anything from your patio to your balcony to an open window to the heating on and a spot lamp if uh, needs be to emulate that summery feeling at the moment. Um, get yourself a little bit of antipasti uh, and a light bodied wine like this and hopefully it'll be something that you enjoy as well. Um, Something to avoid with these wines, because they are very versatile, it's difficult to find things to avoid, but because they are lighter in style, you don't wanna have food that's too bold, too intense, um, that's gonna completely overpower the wine. If you imagine having something delicious like sticky, uh, sticky ribs marinated in something really smoky with that charcoal flavor of the barbecue, um, it's gonna overpower, once you've got all the spice in there as well, it's gonna overpower something like a Pinot Noir or a Zweigelt. So um, tend to go with the, the slightly lighter flavored foods. So I was just talking about barbecue and you might be thinking, why is she torturing us with the idea of a barbecue? But you can 
emulate these flavours at home, get inventive with it, and something that uh, you can always try is barbecue sauce at the back of your cupboard, maybe. Um, and that is going to be a really good match to go with our next wine, which is a Rioja. So here we're looking at the qualities that oak bring to a wine and what they can do for the food you want to pair it with as well. So oak gives flavours of cedar, tobacco, that kind of... Uh, slightly cigar box uh, smell and taste when you have a wine that's been aged in oak for quite a long time. And it can also add sweet spice, uh, things like coconut and vanilla. So all of this complexity, plus the fruit flavours that are already in the wine, so in Rioja we've got Tempranillo, brambly fruit, a nice bit of black fruit as well, um, and this creates a wine that's quite complex, quite full flavoured, quite full bodied, um, and therefore can overpower dishes quite easily. So you do need to be careful with this wine. Um, however, oak and smoke, a really good combination and an easy one to remember. So when I say smoke, I'm not talking about um, smoked salmon um, because that fits into the oily fish category. And oily fish, think back to your sardines. If you happen to have sardines open at the same time as Rioja, do give it a try. There'll always be some people um, that like it but for the most part it will taste really metallic and it won't be an enjoyable experience at all. What you want to look for is something like an aubergine. Uh, you can flame grill it, you can whack it on the barbecue if you're fortunate enough to uh, access one at the moment, um, or whack it in the oven um, with a bit of uh, seasoning um, or under the grill on a high heat to emulate those smoky flavours and try it out with the Rioja. Next up we are moving on to a Cabernet Sauvignon from Chile. So Cabernet Sauvignon is a thick-skinned grape variety. So the reason this is important is because we're looking at tannin levels in a wine and how they interact with food. So tannin is a bitter chemical compound that's found in the grape skins and also the stalks and the stems of grapes. Therefore, the thicker the skin, the higher the level of tannin that's going to be transferred to the ending wine. Um, another grape variety that uh, has a good level of tannin you can explore with is Nebbiolo, grown in the northwest of Italy. Uh, it gets its name from the rolling fog, the nebbia that, that rolls in um, to the Piedmont region uh, surrounding the hills and produces these fantastic high quality wines like Barolo and Barbaresco that people are often put off because they are quite demanding of the palate. They're not as approachable and they do need a little bit of food often to soften the, um, the tannin levels in the wine. So I don't know if you've ever had a wine and you found that the the gums and the saliva are just completely dried out. So that's the the tannins reacting with the protein in your saliva. And um, what we want to do here is is get a food that's got a high level of protein. So looking at red meats, uh, nut roasts, um, mature cheeses, uh, and therefore the tannin reacts to the protein in the food instead, and that drying sensation disappears. The tannins are softened and one plus one equals three. Something that you can try at home if you don't happen to have a pheasant or something like venison or really rich red meats um, is quite simply a bit of salt. So grab yourself a wine that's high in tannin um, and have a sip, uh, notice that drying sensation and then have a little bit of salt and then just dabbing a little bit onto your tongue and then have another sip of the wine and see how that has changed um, the tannin levels. Uh, and that's a good starting point to, to understand why you might like or dislike wines with high levels of tannin. And hopefully it will lead you to appreciating these wines with food um, if you didn't like them previously. Our final wine that we're moving on to um, is a sweet wine. So in front of me, I have the Royal Tokai Five Petunios, um, which is an incredible wine and uh, we like to put it on as many tastings in the cellar as possible purely for the reason that it goes so well with blue cheese and also that we get to drink a little bit of ourselves. So you might be thinking, sweet wine, I thought she said that went with sweet food. So when you get saltiness, I've already mentioned the saltiness can um, strip away fruitiness um, of a wine. So if you start out with something that's got quite a lot of fruit and high sugar content it creates that contrasting match of saltiness of blue cheese, the sweetness of a dessert wine um, is a really good uh, combination if you've not tried it before. Um, it's definitely one to try at home and if you're not a fan of blue cheese, uh, you can just grab the salt again and see what that does to the wine. 
So other alternatives to something like Tokai, um, you've got ice wine from Canada, which can be quite expensive, um, but really worth trying if you get the opportunity to. Um, what you can do with these wines is just get some sugar. Um, or you can bake it into something with something like ground almonds. And what you'll find is you get um, the sweetness in the food matching with the sweetness in the wine. And therefore the wine doesn't fall flat. The sweetness in the food is not completely overpowering it, stripping away the body, stripping away the flavor. What you get instead is those flavors building on each other, intensifying and creating a really, really fantastic uh, flavor combination in your mouth. So that sums up my food and wine matching uh, video for you today. I know there's a lot to get your head around. There's a lot of different examples I've given you, but I would encourage you to, to try different things out at home. So the next time you've cracked a bottle of wine open, maybe grab the salt, grab the sugar, maybe even some mustard or a tin of tomatoes and see how that might change the wine and what you might want to experiment with in the future. When people think of food and wine matching, often they think food first and then wine. But a really good challenge um, is uh, buy a bottle of wine or find a bottle of wine that you know you really like, have a little taste and then see how you might be able to build some food uh, options around that. It's something that I really like to do myself, especially when um, you've got uh, a bit of time on your hands and the store cupboards are looking a bit questionable. Um, it's an opportunity to get creative and uh, you see what you come up with. If this sounds like a good way to um, pass the time, then uh, there's a great website called matchingfoodandwine.com by Fiona Beckett, so renowned food and wine writer. She has a plethora of different examples on her website, which you can browse through. And there's also a really good book called The Wine Dine Dictionary, which I'm a big fan of by Victoria Moore. Um, encourage you to buy from your local bookshops and see uh, if they are available to get that out to you because it's got loads and loads of different examples. It focuses on key flavors and different things that you can toy around with. And while you have got the opportunity to uh, do lots of cooking at home, this might be the, the right time to, to get to know um, what your preferences are. So in addition to that, if you've got any other questions uh, regarding this, then do get in touch. Um, always open to give ideas and, and listen to your examples as well. And uh, do get in touch on events at averys.com. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.